uh, writing a book called The Avoidable War. So I thought uh, where we would start, and the, the game plan tonight is that Jane and I will ask a couple of questions to Kevin to get started, and then we'll have a bit of conversation, and at some point we'll go to the audience for questions. So think of your own questions. But I'm going to start at the top with the title, The Avoidable War, and the book that you're writing. And if you'd give us, a, give us the elevator brief, uh, uh, and when, when are we going to get a chance to read it? Yes. <coughs> sometime, this, sometime this century, I hope. The, um, well, thanks for having me back to uh, the Kennedy School and the Kennedy Forum. And um, Graham, it's good to be uh, here with you and with Jane. Uh, and to all of you who are students here at the Kennedy School or at Harvard, um, to echo what Graham said before. If um, uh, public policy lights up your lights and that's what animates your soul, go for it, because all of our countries need it, um, and this country, the United States, uh, in particular. As you asked me about the book uh, that I'm working on at the moment, The Avoidable War, well, I suppose someone had to write the ultimate response, or at least a response, to the Graham Allison book, Destined for War. Uh, so, uh, and, and given we've worked together here at Harvard in 2014, uh, just after I left political office in Australia, uh, Graham offered me political exile here in, uh, in Harvard. We uh, tried very hard to keep him, but he then <laughs> escaped to New York. But he comes back and visits from time to time. That's right. I'm still a senior fellow at this uh, illustrious institution at Belfer. And so, Graham's book, uh, Destined For, is a excellent read. Uh, because it points to a range of historical probabilities. Uh, as you all know, for those of you familiar with the literature, uh, rising powers, established powers, changes in the balance of power between them, and what states are observed to do under those circumstances in history, and what they may be doing now in the case of China and the United States. Um, I'm not an historical determinist. I think uh, agency, what we do as political leaders and as elites uh, within countries actually matters and changes the course of history. Um, but what we have with Graham's book is a salutary reminder of the structural forces at play. And so when I look at this uh, China-US relationship, I see two or three things at play. Uh, observably, uh, objective changes in the balance of power between these two countries, particularly in the wider Asian theatre. Kids are welcome, it's okay. Um, I, I often bring children to tears when I speak. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, so, sometimes the rest of us, yes. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Uh, that will happen later. And, um, so objectively there's changes in the balance of power between these two countries, whichever barometer you use, you know, the military, the economy, technology, um, hard power, soft power to some extent. Secondly, what we see in the case of China under Xi Jinping is an infinitely more assertive Chinese leadership across all the domains of uh, global policy. Uh, it's just quite clear that that's happening. And thirdly, we also are observing now under the current US administration the trajectory of an uncertain America about its future role in the region and in the world. And so you put those three things together and what I see therefore is a dangerous terrain ahead and one which can either be just left to uh, the forces of nature, so to speak, and we'll see what happens, uh, or you, be, you think through how this new era of so-called strategic competition can be navigated. Now, some would say, um, therefore, that under these circumstances, you know, war might be seen by some as inevitable. I don't have that view. Um, it might be seen by some as probable. I don't actually share that view as well. But I do think it's possible through mutual mismanagement as we go through very difficult, a very difficult decade ahead. And we have to be simply frank about some of the lessons from history, and particularly 1914, to understand how crises arise, how they can be mismanaged, and how they can end in absolute catastrophe. Now, I'm aware of the fact that this relationship is different from any of the 1914 relationships because you've got uh, a level of nuclear deterrence at work. Um, but that doesn't resolve everything. So finally, uh, Graham, what I seek to do in the book 
is to say, here are the things working against us, and how is this possibly navigable in the future? And what I find in the literature often in the United States and in Beijing is you've now got two giant cheer squads. Uh, one in the United States uh, urging America, go, 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 USA, 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 and here is how you can ultimately uh, stop those Chinese from taking over the world. Uh, I've got to say to my Zhongguo uh, Lai de and say Beijing should travel dollar. It's basically the same in China as that uh, you see a whole bunch of people with various levels of advice to, uh, let's call it the Chinese policy establishment of how China can ultimately prevail in this contest, uh, in this competition. What I've tried to do is identify a third way, which is how could these two mature states, who between them actually have much historical wisdom, how can they navigate a peaceful but competitive future between them through what I call managed strategic competition. And that's essentially what the book is about. We can go into a little more of the detail later on, but enough from me on the prospective book promotion sometime next year uh, if the publisher has sufficient patience with me. Yeah, I think uh, next year will not be too soon. Uh, this is an arena that I've been searching in uh, fairly desperately for the past three years since I sent my book to the publisher. And I think that you're likely particularly because you combine uh, a, uh, well, uh, you combine first a, an understanding of both China and the US over a long period of time without being captured by either, uh, a, a serious analytic capability for thinking about options, which is what we try to teach about and learn about here at the school, but also you've been in the real arena of politics where uh, the abstractions of the academy have to get translated into something more practical. So I, I, I would say, hurry with the book. We need it. <laughs> uh, Jane, let me uh, see uh, uh, where would you take us. Yeah, the virtue uh, of being in office, by the way, I see Nick Burns is here. First got to know Nick when he was Deputy Secretary of State. The truth is, if you're in the political process, what you do learn experientially is agency as we discuss it in the international relations and political science literature is real. The decisions of political leaders matter. We're not simply these kind of puppets of, of anonymous uh, structural forces out there. And what leaders decide and those who advise them shape uh, actually determines the future course of history. And so what has reinforced all that in my head, if you like, is someone who's always had an interest in international relations, but having been a practitioner, Prime Minister and Foreign Minister, is what you decide fundamentally matters. It changes the course of things. Well, uh, as, uh, as Mark said, J Jane, until last June, was uh, the bureau chief in Beijing. So she's been watching uh, Beijing very cleverly and for a few years before that in China. She's from Australia, but she knows the US very well. And the good news for those of us here locals, she's now a fellow for the year at the Schornstein Center. So we can actually capture her on days when we're not having a forum event. So Jane, give us your perspective on wh where you see things and wherever you want to go with the conversation. And I have to say it's a very wonderful opportunity to be able to ask a question of the former Prime Minister of Australia. Never done that before. <laughs> <laughs> so that that tells you a lot about the focus of the New York Times, yeah. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> Ooh, uh, see? Blood sport. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Take no prisoners. <laughs> We do have a bureau there now, you know. Yeah, I've met them. And a lot of readers. That's true. <laughs> um, so we've got to assume that in your book, you're going to be tackling one of the big questions, which is how is the big tussle in the Indo-Pacific region? How can this be resolved? So you could look at it this way. You could say the United States is going to concede its 70 years of military and economic dominance in the region. You could say that China is going to back off its goal of dominating the region, unlikely in both cases. So that leaves you with some kind of negotiated deal. What would that look like without each side losing strategic advantage? And in that situation, wouldn't the United States have to give up 
a lot on Hong Kong, Taiwan, South China Sea, East China Sea? Well, I accept some of the premises to the question, but not all of them. If you look at uh, the wider region and people plan scenarios for the future, there's one set of scenarios about China, which is uh, what I describe as the CIA optimism scenario, which <laughs> is uh, China will just kind of internally implode. Um, now, I've been reading sort of various versions of this for the last 35 years that I've been in public policy. It hasn't quite happened yet. Mm -hmm. So uh, I'm not convinced of this one myself. Now, there are certainly structural tensions within China. The political economy questions are real. The forces of uh, left control within a party-controlled state and an economy which is uh, a market economy but now being pulled to the left. There are plenty of things. Uh, which can go wrong in the China, China model. But it's prudent for everyone to assume that this model, which has been around for 40 years or so, is going to bump along and on balance continue to work to a greater or lesser degree. So I don't actually think it's prudent <coughs> policy to base any assumptions on that. Uh, then you've got another set of assumptions, which is the United States uh, will uh, magically get its strategic act together. Um, and right now, in my own judgment, it doesn't have its act together. I think uh, what it passes for high policy in Washington at the moment is a strategic shambles. And I've seen a lot of it at US administrations, work with a lot of them, Republican and Democrat, but this one's right out there. Um, <laughs> so I don't want to be partisan, <laughs> but I just thought I'd say that. Um, um, but... Uh, there's a big caveat to that, which is people are assuming the inevitability of uh, uh, the re-election of the Trump administration. Uh, Democrats, if they're elected under whichever candidate, are likely to assemble a professional team and reconstitute and constitute afresh a viable long-term strategy uh, for dealing with China's rise. And so I think uh, that is a credible part of our assumptions for the future. Not inevitable, but it's a credible part of our assumptions for the future. And finally, I think what is reasonably credible, therefore, is that you're still going to have a coherent China continuing to grow, albeit with an imperfect model, and an America which doesn't simply uh, degenerate, but in fact rebuilds and reconstitutes itself. So they're my premises for what we look at for the future. And so I do not believe that you can credibly have uh, a grand strategic bargain, which in the tradition of Spain and Portugal and the medieval popes or the post-medieval popes draw a line down the centre of the map and say, yours and yours. Hence why we've got Brazil, I suppose, uh, as opposed to the Spanish-speaking world. Uh, it's not going to be like that. But I think what you can do um, is, and when I go back to my notion of managed strategic competition, is something with four or five core points to it. One, I am a realist in the sense that ultimately the behaviour of states is determined by the realities of an objective and perceived balance of power. It may be an old-fashioned view in various parts of the world, but in my observation of states' behaviour, it is a critical determinant. Now, at present, there is an assumption that this is just drifting all in China's direction. I think the United States, if it uh, acts militarily, economically, and to some extent technologically, in fact, fundamentally technologically, um, then that is no longer simply an assumed reality. This balance of power could well continue to be in America's favour for quite a long time into the future. But that's the first element of strategic realism, and, and the ball is very much in America's court. And it's doing a very bad job of it at present. The fracturing of alliances, just being one example. Second element, I think, is, and this comes to the real heart of your question, Jane, which is, what are the um, core national interests of uh, both sides, which are ultimately, at this stage, non-negotiable and non-compromisable? Now, there... Um, I think we need to take a lesson from the uh, Nadir and then the, uh, shall we say, more mature evolution of the US-Soviet relationship when things went radically wrong, uh, Cuba, the expert on Cuba and the missile crisis to my right, essence of decision. 
and frankly, the reflection on the Cuban Missile Crisis and what then happened with a period of détente afterwards, mm -hmm. where both sides looked mm -hmm. at the abyss and said, that is a very mm -hmm. deep hole mm -hmm. which we should not fall into. Mm -hmm. So on these, um, let's call it fundamental core national interests, you've mentioned one, Taiwan, South China Sea, East China Sea, um, and one or two others besides, uh, in the high point of, let's call it détente, an absolute strategic realism, uh, in the private diplomacy of the United States and the Soviet Union, certain red lines were drawn, mm -hmm. and both sides knew where not to go. Mm -hmm. uh, these were contested red lines, but they were clear red lines nonetheless. The problem we have at the moment is a lack of clarity on some of that, and a lack of clarity yeah. can often uh, cause you to fall into the abyss. And just finally, on the logic of it, then there's a category of activity which I would describe as um, uh, significant national interest, though not core, where negotiation and resolution are possible. For example, the rules of global commerce, uh, which are now highly contested, whether it's digital or in the general traded economy, uh, where the, the, dis the gap between the two sides is huge. But if there's will and political will, a capacity to bridge. And then what I'd describe as negotiable national interests. And that's where, frankly, under a future Democrat administration, the common interest of both sides for a global compact on climate change is huge and self-evident, and was under the Obama administration. And the final element of what I describe as managed strategic competition is this. You know, we'd be blind not to recognise the fact that we have at present uh, the emergence of an, a contest of ideas as well. It's not as sharp and as stark as it was in the Cold War between the Soviet Union and the United States, but we have, in effect, liberal capitalism and authoritarian capitalism. Uh, these are the two models progressively on offer, and you know the sub-detail of each of those. If you have the rest of the architecture which I've just described, what I described as managed strategic competition, anchored in the balance of power, categorization of, let's call it, the rest of the relationship, the final principle should be, and may the best man or woman win in the global contest for ideas. If China is confident about the ultimate uh, integrity, utility and effectiveness of its body of ideas about how to organise the political economy in the future, not just for itself, but more broadly around the world, well, fine, see who prevails. Um, if liberal democracy, as those of us from the Western tradition would argue, is in fact, uh, ultimately, uh, a more effective uh, set of ideas, then it will prevail. So let's have an ideological or an ideational contest, but one which doesn't throw us over a cliff uh, and into irreconcilable conflict. If I could just follow up yeah. for one second. We had an interesting, in our interest uh, class on um, reasoning from history recent, just last week, um, Fred Logovell said, put up five indicators of what the old Cold War was like, and one of the indicators was absence of diplomacy. Mm. So, uh, in the early years, but mm. then there was diplomacy, there as was. you said. So, if a new administration comes in, you're saying we can start some diplomacy modeled after, not necessarily modeled after, but somewhat similar to resolve the problem as with the Soviet Union? Yeah, I think if you look at the evolution of the Cold War, it's at least in a couple of phases for which the, frankly, the critical mutual learning experience was the missile crisis. Um, and detente, the missile crisis was in uh, the early 60s, detente begins to emerge by the late 60s. And it was a deep institutional reflection both in Moscow and in, uh, in Washington. So and if you stand back from that again, what I described before is the balance of power uh, what the Soviets and the Chinese uh, would still describe as the correlation of forces. Um, this is, if you like, structure shaping the international environment, mm -hmm. but agency, in my view, lies in good old-fashioned diplomacy and how you actually shape things. Diplomacy matters. It's not just having a chat. Uh, if, frankly, in high diplomacy, it's about, for example, having a set of strategic understandings along the lines that I was just running through before. If you wish to manage strategic competition, the alternative is uh, you just roll the dice every morning and see what happens. Uh, I'm a little more cautious than that myself. <laughs> so Ke Kevin, you're, you're one of the few people, maybe the only person in the room, uh, 
that uh, knows Xi Jinping, the leader of China. And you, as we were talking today, you saw him uh, with Henry Kissinger in a group in China a week before last. But I remember when you were here with visiting us, you had, in, uh, when he was vice president, he had come and visited you in Australia and you took him around for, I don't know, a week or whatever. So you've studied him for a long time, talked to him many times. So you were talking to him last week and you were, t if you were telling something like just what you said, you know, how would he regard that? And secondly, what else from that conversation are you prepared to share with us? <laughs> the, um, well, uh, the honest answer is I don't know how Xi Da would respond to what I just said. That's uh, Chinese for Uncle Xi, by the way. That's mm -hmm. the term of, uh, of art within Beijing now. Though I understand from the uh, Xuantran Bu, the propaganda department, we can't say Xi Da Da anymore. We just say emperor, yes. Yeah. No, we just say President <laughs> Xi. There you go. <coughs> the, uh, but when I was here working with you, uh, Graham, uh, several years ago, I put together uh, here uh, at uh, the Belfast Centre um, a paper uh, reflection on a year's work uh, entitled um, Constructive Realism, which was uh, the future of US-China relations under Xi Jinping. Uh, and, uh, and we put that into Chinese and we circulated it into the Chinese system. Um, uh, my understanding from our Chinese friends and colleagues who at that stage were dealing with the Obama administration, that they found it um, uh, useful in its realism uh, and um, positive, quote unquote, in its uh, embrace of constructive diplomatic alternatives. So I do not think from my own observations and engagement with Chinese think tanks that this sort of conceptual approach is automatically ruled out at all because it tries to breach two realities. One is, there is a real factor in international relations about uh, state power, and you can't walk away from it. But simultaneously, it's the constructive diplomacy which enables you to navigate and negotiate state power. So I think at that level, uh, I don't think the door has been shut, at least in Beijing, on these sorts of ideas. Uh, I'm pretty confident the door would be shut in Washington right now on that body of ideas, but maybe in the future that will change. Uh, as for Xi Jinping the other day, um, what I observed with um, the Chinese president in the hour or so we had with um, uh, Henry and Hank and a few others uh, in the Great Hall of the People uh, was uh, a Chinese president completely on top of his game, uh, fielded happily any question from the floor uh, without any notes for more than an hour. Um, and uh, on the future of uh, the market in uh, China's uh, long-term economic reform program, on the future of the US-China uh, trade war negotiations, um, as well as uh, interesting observations about the future relationship between uh, China and Japan. But I've got to say, having observed Xi Jinping many times over the years, uh, for a, a guy who should be under a lot of political pressure at present, because the Chinese economy domestically is weakening, uh, he struck me as remarkably comfortable in his own skin and confident, at least in dealing with us foreign barbarians. Mm -hmm. So that's, a, again, for those of you who don't follow China carefully, that's a quite a big takeaway because politicians can understand things about politicians better than the rest of us, or certainly better than analysts like me, and can feel the, the, the vibes and watch a lot of the body language and see. And as you say, objectively, if I were just reading the newspapers here, I would imagine he would be under considerable pressure and certainly from many previous Chinese leaders and many American leaders, they wouldn't answer questions of all sorts, unscripted, uh, with such confidence, so that's an interesting... Well, there's uh, a huge contrast between he and Hu Jintao. Right. Uh, and uh, Hu Jintao, who I knew quite well, Hu Jintao was a note reader. So, <laughs> how are you this morning, Prime Minister Rudd? Yeah. <laughs> uh, number three. Uh, number I three. I think I'm feeling good. Yes. Uh, that's right. Uh, how long was it to fly from Australia this morning? Um, that was Hu Jintao style. I would read my notes. I've never <laughs> seen Xi Jinping use a note in all of my engagements with him. 
This is quite unique in the evolution of Chinese political leaders. The guy has quite a deep, uh, let's call it intellectual and policy framework. So he is uh, very much uh, his own leader. He is not being led uh, by those around him. And I think it's very important for American political leaders to understand that. I want to ask a, an Australia-specific question. But I didn't do it. But before I, <laughs> but before I do, I can't resist but ask: What did he have to say about the future of China-Japan relations? This is this is very important because he's going yeah. to Japan in the spring, and he's mm. going to meet the emperor, which is the second time he's going to meet a Japanese uh, emperor. Well, what struck me? Um, uh, Maybe Kevin, before we do it, just do a paragraph for Jane, uh, for people that haven't been following China and Japan, so they just get a little, yeah, little sure. bit of the picture. Yeah. Well, China-Japan, as we know, has been a less than felicitous relationship in recent history. Um, and uh, effectively, Japan was put into the uh, Chinese sinbin, um, <laughs> it's a term of Australian football. That's when you get sent off and you get sent to the sinbin for foul play. <laughs> That's why Australian politicians behave in the way in which they do as well. You get sent to the sinbin or discharged from the chamber. But after the Senkoku Dao uh, crisis following Japan's nationalization of the islands uh, back in 1112, I think it was, um, then uh, really from that time until the present, uh, we have had uh, a, an effective freeze in high level political contact between the two countries until a year or so ago. And the unfreeze began to happen as very soon after the current Trump administration declared the end of strategic engagement between the United States and China, beginning of this period of strategic competition. So my own view, uh, not disputed by my interlocutors in Beijing, is as the Chinese concluded that the US-China relationship was now entering into fundamental structural friction. I love the sound effects here in the, uh, <laughs> in the, uh, in the forum. Uh, entering fundamental structural friction uh, so you could observe a decision to uh, reduce tensions uh, at the political level, both with Tokyo and with Delhi, and frankly, you see the same in Europe as mm. well, on Beijing's part. Mm. Um, and so uh, the Japan relationship has been taken out of the freezer, and as you said, we have a, uh, a full state visit in March next year. So this is relatively new in the unfreeze. There's a whole lot <coughs> economically happening in the Japan-China relationship which hadn't been happening until a year or so ago. Uh, security tensions remain sharp in the East China Sea. The intensity of, of uh, let's call it, uh, Chinese uh, military and Coast Guard deployments in and around Sankoku Dao uh, continues. Um, so, but in the framework of all that, I was fascinated to hear Xi Jinping's reflections, which were along the lines of, look, there have been some uh, difficult times in the US, uh, uh, sorry, in the Japan China relationship. Bu yu kuai de rizu was his words. Uh, but for the bulk of the history of this uh, relationship be between the two of us, uh, it has been much better than that. And geography can never separate us. And he was reflecting an optimism that structurally this relationship with Japan could seriously improve. And so I was kind of taken by the forward-leaning positive nature of his presentation on, uh, on Japan, and I'm sure it's been conveyed back to uh, the Japanese side as they look forward to next March. So on the Australian position, I mean, if I can say as an Australian, we are closer to China uh, than the United States is, but we have been, had a very, very solid alliance with the United States, if I can frame it a little bit. Australia's first independent diplomatic mission was in Washington in 1940, am I correct? And ever since, for 70 years, Australia and the United States have enjoyed a very, very strong strategic uh, alliance. Um, but in the last 30 years, or and in the last 30 years, uh, Australia has enjoyed a basically recession-proof economy. Why? Because uh, Australia has been digging minerals out of the desert as fast as they can to sell to China and selling other goods and China has become very dependent on China economically. So the question is, if something happens in the South China Sea, uh, say a Chinese shoot an American aircraft down, 
either accidentally or... Always beware when journalists set up hypotheticals. <laughs> I knew you were going to do this, but I wanted to try. Uh, <laughs> what if a plane is uh, shot down uh, accidentally? One not purposely? two. Okay, got it. Yeah. yeah. And uh, what does Australia do? Is it prepared to uh, <coughs> sacrifice its economic relationship with China for the long-term... Uh, defense umbrella relationship with the United States? Yeah, one of the, um, first of all, a, a point about the background, and then me, let me go to specific scenarios. On the background, you're right. I mean, um, the relationship with the United States is deep and long, goes back, in fact, 100 years. Australians and uh, Americans first jumped into the trenches with each other in 1918. Mm -hmm. Interestingly, for our American friends here, uh, under an Australian general, um, American forces were deployed on the on the first deployed on the Western Front, um, Battle of Hamel. Uh, and since then, the relationship strategically and militarily has been very close, currently articulated through the ANZUS Treaty of 1951, which is a mutual defence pact like the uh, NATO Treaty uh, with relevant uh, obligations. And what are those obligations? The obligations are as follows. Um, if I recall the text of the treaty, that, uh, uh, that uh, if... Uh, either of the treaty partners, the United States uh, or Australia, uh, suffer an attack on their metropolitan territory, uh, they shall, according to their constitutional processes, uh, consult uh, and then act to meet the common danger. There's only one time we've ever invoked that, and that was straight after September 11, um, where, surprisingly, uh, it was the United States that was attacked, hmm. uh, whereas, obviously, the assumption in the treaty drafters uh, was that uh, it'll be those of us closer to the firing line in Asia that would be uh, the invokees, uh, or the invokers, I should say, of the uh, alliance obligation. The second provision, and hence your question, is that if the armed forces of either the treaty, pass, tr treaty partners are attacked uh, in the Pacific area, then, according to their constitutional processes, they shall act to meet the common danger. So you go to the hypothesis of South China Sea, the usual one that's thrown up is Taiwan, etc. cetera. Um, the s attitude of successive Australian governments, you will understand this, is uh, never to speculate on any particular scenarios which might arise in the future. Uh, s the, uh, and similarly, if you look at uh, American posture, for example, on the Taiwan question, has for some decades maintained a clear level of strategic ambiguity as to what the United States would do under the scenario that Taiwan was militarily attacked or other military actions taken against Taiwan. I think ourselves as a responsible ally, like the Japanese, we simply adopted the same position. And even though I'm not in office at the moment, I never think it's productive or positive to comment on what any sovereign Australian government would do should the treaty be evoked, uh, invoked. Uh, but the bottom line is, um, China, if I can just look at uh, the world from a Beijing perspective uh, for a moment, when they look at scenarios in the East China Sea with Sankoku, South China Sea, uh, as well as Taiwan, uh, with greater or lesser degrees of anxiety and concern, always has to factor in the... Uh, uh, future variable of common allied action of one form or another. And that is that in the event of a crisis arising, it would not just be the United States. Uh, it could well be the United States plus its allies, depending on the scenario. And beyond that, in terms of other forms of action, including economic action, uh, beyond, the beyond the Asian allies as well. Uh, you'll note, for example, in the NATO communique that China is listed for the first time as a country of concern to the NATO allies. Concern and opportunity. But this is a first in terms of the transatlantic partners. So uh, do the NATO partners or the other Asian allies specify what they would do under individual circumstances? No. no. That's called diplomacy. <laughs> okay. Let me ask one more question and then we're going to uh, have opportunity for folks uh, here and to stay with the Australia for a little bit. So whenever I introduce uh, Kevin, usually, uh, or other Australians, I remind people that Australia has been the uh, uh, firmest ally of the US for the last 100 years and fought 
side by side with Americans in every war that we fought in, sane or insane. Uh, and uh, yeah, Kevin usually ones. reminds me <laughs> that, uh, yes, but the Americans showed up a couple of years late for the First World War, which is also correct. The Australians were there fighting before. The other thing is that when the Australians show up, they don't come to ask for help. They show up and they're ready to fight. So that's a, another extremely impressive thing about Australia's role throughout uh, all of this. Which I put it down to a common history of contact football. Uh, yeah. That uh, you know we don't play the round ball game. Exactly. And, so uh, you yeah. give blood playing rugby, and we do. Uh, By the way, you showed up a couple of years late in the Second World War as well. Well, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> so you usually lead the way. Uh, unfortunately, we led the way in uh, a few other places that you showed up afterwards. Maybe wisely. Maybe wisely, not. I think. Maybe wisely. <laughs> maybe not. Uh, but we should think about Chinese friends here, actually. Because when Japan invaded uh, China for the first time in 1931, uh, and then again with a massive escalation in 36, uh, the rest of us did not act. Right. Um, and they and the Chinese uh, occupation, the Japanese occupation of China, continued apace until 41, when America was obviously attacked, and then we entered as allies with China, then nationalist China, in the Second World War. But I'm just picking up Jane's question that, uh, on the one hand, you have as tight a security relationship with the U.S as virtually any country. That's on the one hand. On the other hand, uh, in the 21st century, uh, China has emerged to be your dominant trading partner. I think uh, something like 60% of the trade now? No, 30. 30%? Mm -hmm. But compared to the US? Well, the US would be something like about 12, I'd say. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So in terms of the comparison, your most important trading partner. So if Americans come to you and say, uh, you have to choose between your security relationship with us on the one hand and your economic relationship with China on the other, as you've written brilliantly in a number of things recently about the decoupling talk, most of that's nonsense. And mostly leaders, when told to do that, mm. say, forget about it. We're not choosing. We're going to have a relationship with both. But Australia has been squeezed by this in the Huawei case mm. and others. So just help us understand that sure. since I, I think that's going to be a dynamic for many countries and then especially for Australia where there's such a, a deep relationship with the security terms. But as Jane points out, a country that hasn't had a recession for 30 years, uh, the prime minister who puts it into recession probably won't be prime minister for very long. I think um, the first thing to um, uh, reflect on in response to the question is that Australia on this question is not Robinson Crusoe. Um, if you look across the rest of Asia, most of the rest of Asia now has China as its dominant uh, trading oh, partner. All, all of the major countries. That's yes. true. And some with the same level of intensity that we have. Um, and in fact, if you begin to look across Europe, uh, so the pattern begins to unfold as well. So. Uh, there is often a lot of focus on the Australian example here, but frankly, yeah. this is a dilemma for all American allies Absolutely. in Asia, in Europe, who have a security relationship with the United States, but frankly, now a dominant economic relationship with China. More so in trade, in, in terms of capital markets, uh, much more ambiguous, where America remains uh, the major uh, source of uh, global capital flows. So we should bear that in mind. It's not just heading in one direction. Um, so that's the first point. We're just not alone on that. Secondly, the, the Rudd Doctrine, uh, when I was uh, Prime Minister, uh, this is using irony for Australians, uh, was uh, uh, very, very complex. It was called, We Walk and Chew Gum at the Same Time. Uh, and that is, uh, we'll have an alliance with the United States and we'll do whatever we need to do in the economy with the Chinese. Thank you very much. In my meetings with Chinese leaders, they usually went along these lines. Good morning. Um, number one, we're American allies. There are reasons for that. It's called the Second World War. Uh, <laughs> that's why we have an alliance. And if you're 25 million people sitting on a continent which is the landmass of the United States minus Alaska in the middle of nowhere, you would probably seek to have an alliance with a very powerful friend with whom you sh shared basic values, particularly when you've got one of the lo longest coastlines in the world and the world's third largest exclusive economic zone. Point one. And then you say, and friends, that's not going to change. 
Point two, we also believe in universal human rights. Uh, that's who we are. Why? Because we're from the West. That's the tradition we come from. Um, we can't change the way we think. That's just us. That's part of our essential being. Three, I then say to our Chinese counterparts, now, within those constraints, uh, how do we make a whole lot of money together? Um, so, uh, and, uh, and it is that sort of, uh, I think, brutal realism, which I have found in my dealings with Chinese counterparts, is reasonably effective, uh, reasonably effective. They don't like part one and part two, but they recognize the reality of it. Uh, and then we get to focus on part three. It's when you start dancing around one and two and pretending that they don't exist or only partly exist that you often get into all sorts of trouble. Uh, now, you've legitimately, Graham, gone to the current uh, dilemma around Huawei. I'll just make a, a, a little example here. In Japan, uh, which is uh, as strong an ally of the United States as is Australia, uh, Japan has currently uh, got a policy on uh, Huawei and 5G, which in substance is identical to the Australian policy. It's simply in their diplomatic communication of it, they've done it with what I would describe as high levels of Japanese finesse. <laughs> it's almost like a tea ceremony. They say, ah, Huawei, 5G. Well, for the future of 5G, we in Japan, we like a system which has the following characteristics. We're not quite sure whether Huawei will meet those characteristics or requirements. Perhaps not. Um, but that's a matter for the future. Uh, then on the Belt and Road Initiative, they say, ah, the Belt and Road Initiative. Now, if the Belt and Road Initiative in the future is conducted on the basis of full transparency, sustainability, and et cetera, then of course we in Japan would like to collaborate with the Belt and Road Initiative in the future. What a great idea. But until that time, uh, we'll probably end up doing our own thing, no offense. Um, whereas in Australia, we tend to say, nah, go away. Uh, <laughs> that's what I describe as a lack of finesse. I think we need to study the Japanese tea ceremonies a little more closely. Okay. Uh, let me take us to the audience, but let me start by uh, taking advantage of the fact that we have among our audience uh, Professor Nick Burns, a colleague and friend, who was Under Secretary of State for Policy when Kevin was the Prime Minister and so had some time working with him. And Kevin said something about diplomacy matters. Nick heads up the project here at Harvard on diplomacy. So would you use the microphone and uh, Ask the first question, and then there's microphones on the ground floor and in the loges. But we'll start with Nick. What an honor. It's Australia Day at the Kennedy School. <laughs> Julie Bishop was here and spoke to our students, many of whom are in the front row from Australia and New Zealand. She bumped into Kevin Rudd. They didn't know they were together at this school, so pleasure to have them both here. Kevin... It was um, a friendly meeting, by the way. It was a very friendly meeting. Julie and I are good friends. I've already tweeted about it. You can see the photograph of them, both of them on Twitter. Kevin, um, I think the thing that we're struggling with in the United States is what you're struggling with in Australia. I just spent three weeks in Australia this autumn as a fellow at the Lowy Institute. 34% of your trade is with China. You've had 28 years of uninterrupted economic growth because of that relationship. 25% of the students at the University of Sydney are Chinese nationals. There's a relationship there where you're very vulnerable to Chinese action should they decide that You've taken actions that are unfavorable to them. Um, how, do you, how do you both cooperate with China and yet balance it by competition? We're facing the same problem here. Hmm. We're in a highly competitive phase of the US-China relationship. They are a strategic adversary for our country. I get that. And you and I were together this summer talking about this, but we need them on climate change hmm. and stabilizing the global economy. It seems to me that both Australia and the United States, from different vantage points, have to find a way to achieve this balance with this extraordinary country. Yeah, well, you're absolutely right. A, a, a point in parenthesis on the way through. Yes, we're into our 29th year of consecutive growth. Uh, Jane mentioned this as well. Um, it's not just because of China and the, great, and the global financial crisis. Some of us were prime minister at the time and we engaged in a 5.6% of GDP stimulus package. Uh, employed on intelligent Keynesian lines, which uniquely amongst the OECD helped keep us out of recession as well. So it was China plus domestic action. But that's uh, a marginal point against the central one that you, central question that you ask, which is uh, how do we deal with uh, the dilemma? You know, if we took um, Graham's historical lens, 
which I think is uh, highly instructive for all of us. And how have we managed massively disparate systems uh, negotiating their futures? Uh, we seem to think that the American China, uh, Chinese, or the Western Chinese gap uh, is without historical precedent. Well, I don't necessarily think that's the case. Um, there are other examples in history of vastly divergent cultures and civilizations, uh, which uh, upon their encounter uh, did not simply uh, degenerate into automatic conflict. And remember, in the evolution of things, uh, that uh, in the Cold War, the Soviet Union and the United States managed to come out of that without blowing each other's brains out. And I could not think of two more disparate strategic cultures than those two. Cool. So I think we just need a little bit of historical perspective and say these, this is not Mars and Venus. Uh, this is China and the United States, two sophisticated political systems with highly evolved political cultures, highly rational individuals uh, within those cultures who are capable of negotiating common outcomes. So my response to your question, uh, Nick, is to go back to the principles of managed strategic competition that I sought to outline before because I do not see an alternative, which is why I'm writing a book entitled The Avoidable War. It's not just a pious aspiration and hope. It's a piece of diplomacy which says, look, China ultimately respects power. Uh, I know enough about Chinese Marxism-Leninism and Chinese traditional views of statecraft to know that power matters. Um, and therefore, China, when it looks at the United States, is fundamentally not simply attracted by the scenery. Uh, <laughs> it's not simply um, admiring of the fact that at Harvard you've got some nice buildings. Um, they are deeply respectful of the fact that this is enormously powerful country, aggregating all the elements of power. So when I said the first principle of what I describe as managed strategic competition is for the United States and China to both recognize that this balance of power can be maintained in a manner which is stabilizing and not destabilizing is actually the, f the foundation stone for the future. And in America's case, um, let's call it repairing America domestically, including uh, a revolution in this nation's investment in its basic science and research, uh, is fundamental to the sustainment of that balance uh, into the future. Otherwise, others party to this strategic relationship will form an even deeper conclusion that America is sliding its way out of history. Uh, uh, the rest is as I described before, and that is an architecture within the arrangement based on high diplomacy, uh, which recognizes core interests and protocols for managing those core interests through private diplomacy, uh, significant interests which are difficult but navigable, um, uh, self-evident common interests such as climate and as I said a mature recognition that if um, if we're going to have a big ideological debate about liberal democracy and um, and um, and uh, let's call it state capitalism authoritarian capitalism call it what you will then as I said let a hundred flowers bloom and let a hundred schools of thought contend by Hua Chi Fang and uh, to see uh, who, who ultimately um, prevails and I'm sure each side will be backing their own set of ideas. That seems like a, a worthwhile one. We have only a few minutes, so we're going to try to do short questions and short answers. This lady's first. Thank you so much, um, Mr. Prime Minister. My name is Erin Gregor. I'm a Master in Public Policy student. And um, you started to get to it at the end of your question there, but I wanted to bring Hong Kong into the conversation hmm. and the fact that neither the US or Australia has come out particularly strongly in defense of democracy in that situation. I wanted to ask your perspective on that and whether you think that that's an area of opportunity for Australia or the US, or if they're being kind of clever in this situation to not um, come out too strongly. Well, if I observe the United States Congress, I think they've had a particularly de strong declaratory position and called the Hong Kong Human Rights and Democracy Act, uh, which uh, the president chose not to veto. And I presume the reason he chose not to veto it was because it was passed unanimously in the Senate right. and with one dissenting vote in the House of Representatives. And that does not often occur in the United States Congress. I'm reliably informed <laughs> by Amer my American <laughs> friends. Um, so I think there's a fairly clear declaration from the United States. What I find fascinating is the Chinese response to this officially. And that, uh, and that is, it has been very, very restrained. Uh, the single Chinese action that I have seen taken in response to this enactment 
has been a refusal for uh, a refueling visit uh, by uh, American aircraft carrier in Hong Kong. That's not unique, that's happened before. Uh, it strikes me as the lightest measure possible. And what do I take from that is that uh, China itself continues to be deeply respectful of American economic power, uh, particularly in the context of the as yet unresolved US-China trade war. Um, more broadly on the Hong Kong question, could I just say this? Look, this is going to take phenomenal uh, political wisdom in an environment which is just vexed and uh, difficult. Um, and within one country, two systems. Uh, my strong counsel to our Chinese friends uh, would be to reflect on the fact uh, that Hong Kong uh, guaranteed a high degree of autonomy in the arrangements of 1997 uh, and for those to be provided for 50 years. Uh, that China should recognize the fact that on the sovereignty question, China won the fight back in 97. They got it back from the British. End of the opium war, shall we say, national disgrace. Tick. Number two, Hong Kong used to be central to the future of China's economy. No longer is. Hong Kong's economy is now smaller than Shenzhen's mm. across the border, that fishing village of 40 years ago. Mm. It's now bigger than Hong Kong. And so three, I would strongly counsel our Chinese friends, find a political formula to help calm things down within uh, Hong Kong itself. <coughs> and over time, over time, I think about the desirability, perhaps when we get to the 25 year point in two years time, of offering Hong Kong a further 50 years of one country, two systems, thereby de-escalating the tensions one I, step further. I wish they were listening to you. This gentleman, please. Hi, uh, my name is uh, Farouk Martins, RSI Enterprises. Do you think North Korea can provoke any hostile action towards the South, Japan, or Australia without the real knowledge of China? Okay. Thank you. Uh, very briefly, Again. Nick is a great expert on this question uh, of uh, the North, North Korean, uh, let's call it nuclear program, as well as let's call it the wider diplomacy of dealing with the North Koreans. Very briefly, because our time's limited, all I'd say is I look very carefully and with a high degree of caution at uh, Kim Jong-un deciding to ride a white horse on Mount Pekchu. Um, for those of you who followed uh, the news of the last 24, 36 hours. When I was in office, I chose not to ride white horses uh, on mountains. Didn't think it would look good in the political campaign. But uh, if you look at the history of these things, these are often done to presage a particular significant policy development. Uh, I fear, I genuinely fear that the uh, North Koreans are contemplating the recommencement of testing, mm -hmm. um, either significant ballistic missile tests uh, or nuclear uh, devices. And then I think we're into a whole world of pain. On the core element of your question, does China necessarily know um, uh, about each of these measures? Uh, look, I will defer to Nick on these questions, but my experience having dealt with the Chinese through the history of the six party talks, is the Chinese were often as mystified by the rest of us about what was going on in Pyongyang uh, to assume that these are seamless political entities who have a common security policy framework uh, based on their common military endeavors in the Korean War misunderstands the deep mutual distrust uh, which has evolved since then between great, the two of them. Great topic, we could have a whole session on it. There's actually an excellent article in the New York Times today precisely on target. So in the loge, please. Sure, and uh, my name is Ben Bolger. And um, a question about, uh, at some point, President Trump will no longer be president, um, either through impeachment or being uh, defeated in an election. And I assume the next president will have a different outlook on American foreign policy. China has a very long memory, um, but of course they recognize that administrations change. So to the next leader that deals with Australia and China and other countries, should they just simply move forward? Uh, sometimes an apology goes a long way, but it can be viewed as a sign of weakness. It can sometimes be viewed as a sign of strength. How should the next leader in America move forward if they feel that there should be a different course for America than the one that President Trump has set? 
Look, uh, China's a mature nation state. They're not in the business of, you know, apologies um, around such matters. President Trump is President Trump. He's sui generis. Um, I haven't seen anything like it. Um, let me make one slight broader point. When uh, my, my judgment is that China on balance would prefer to see President Trump re-elected. Um, and the reason why I think China thinks that is because uh, he is bad for the brand of democracy uh, globally. Um, uh, they see President Trump as disabling uh, America's normal decision-making processes and they see President Trump as bad for the global system of American alliances, both in Asia uh, and in Europe. Now, a lot of people in Washington would find this an outrageous proposition because of all the hoopla around the trade war. China takes a very deep and long strategic view of these questions. They see President Trump as tactically irritating on the question of trade and strategically advantageous in terms of the damage done elsewhere. Okay, thank you. With the lodge here, please. Hi, my name is Robert. I'm an MPA student here. Um, Prime Minister Rudd, I found it helpful, uh, the three sort of main observations you had in the beginning on the uh, kind of trajectory of the relationship um, in terms of sort of the change in the power dynamic, assertiveness of China, and relative uncertainty for the U.S. I'm wondering how you see that showing up in the current trade war and how decisive, if at all, you think the results of the trade war will have on the broader trajectory of the relationship? Look, for what it's worth, um, I've been all year predicting that they would uh, reach a form of agreement by year's end. So I'm going to lose a $10 bet fairly soon if it doesn't happen. Um, but actually, that still remain, that remains my view. Uh, the reason is... Uh, You've got 25 more days, so don't right. give up. Uh, and, uh, well, there's a huge new tranche of uh, tariffs ready for imposition as of December 15. Yeah, December 15. Uh, and my own view, it's in mutual <coughs> economic self-interest of both sides to stabilise markets. Chinese economy is already weakening because of domestic economic policy settings and, and frankly, the impact so far of the tariff regime on the traded sector of the Chinese economy, probably knocking 1% of growth as it stands. And the American economy, while the stock market's doing fine, underneath it all, the actual growth rate is slowing. So my belief is that, quote, the phase one deal uh, will still on balance be transacted. What I'm now less confident about is phase two, because the heart of phase two is actually goes to the heart of the Chinese political economy model, which is the future of what we call Chinese state subsidy of Chinese private firms operating in the global marketplace. I think that's intractable. So I think we're going to have an untidy outcome, a phase one deal sufficient to stabilize financial markets in the interests of both sides. Um, otherwise, it's mayhem. You saw the early taste of that earlier this week. Again, phase two may well slide into the sunset. My name is uh, Norio Kishikata from uh, at Japanese Foreign, Foreign Service and uh, now with the US Open program and previously posted in Beijing. Um, my question is, uh, uh, in, in your talk, uh, you kind of uh, expected you know, that the change of uh, US administration may lead to a change of uh, US policy to China. And uh, I was wondering, you know, like following what's happening in US Congress, including you know, like Hong Kong Human Rights and Democracy Act, there, there seems to be emerge, emerging kind of consensus among uh, at least you know, US congressmen, uh, congresspersons regarding a kind of tough policy on China. Mm -hmm. And I wonder how you envision the, the kind of possible change of policy under these kind of uh, political uh, environments mm -hmm. uh, n now taking place in the United States. Look, um, great question. Give my regards to all my friends on the Gaima Show, and uh, and uh, I've worked with many Japanese colleagues over the years. Uh, I think the first uh, point is uh, we all recognise that uh, sentiment in in uh, Washington uh, is uh, relatively uniform on the question of uh, a change in fundamental strategic direction as it relates to China, Republican, Democrat. So what's the difference? In the case of uh, the Republican strategy, quote unquote, it's fundamentally disabled by the fact that uh, we have an unpredictable president uh, and you have a divided White House uh, on the question of what happens with economic engagement slash economic decoupling. Uh, what is the actual strategy on 
uh, trade. What is the actual strategy on foreign direct investment? I don't know. What's the strategy actually on technology? I can see it on uh, Huawei, but beyond Huawei in terms of the future of the engine room of the future digital economy, which is computer chips and semiconductors, I don't know what it is. Uh, before you get to foreign policy and security policy and human rights, we're frankly on the latter. The uh, administration is missing in action more often than not. What I see happening with the Democrats, if they engage um, a professional team, as they have done in the past, uh, it will be a hardline strategy as it relates to China, but it will be predictable. It'll be systematic. That's their nature. Uh, it'll be the sort of thing that China was actually anxious about with the prospective election of the Hillary Clinton administration in 2016. So that is what I see uh, the difference as lying, not in terms of underlying sentiment. But my overall commentary on the United States at present is this. America currently has an attitude about China, which is very negative. America as yet does not have a comprehensive national strategy for dealing with China. That's what we've got at the moment. And I think that may change, depending on the nature of the team. So we're just about to run over time, but what I propose to question over here. No, what I propose to do is let this lady and this gentleman and this gentleman each ask your questions briefly, and then we'll ask Kevin to do a, a brief rip, uh, rip, rip together, please. Hi, Prime Minister Rudd. I'm Helen Zhang. I'm a mid-career MPA student here, and I've actually followed your um, in your footsteps. I went to the ANU and then joined the Foreign Service. So okay. here I am. Yeah. Uh, not going to enter the blood sports of politics, maybe. The wise, Prime, wise Prime Minister woman. just can't be far away, <laughs> yes. Uh, you're a very um, wise woman. My question is about succession. So I think we've uh, often heard the phrase that you know, Xi Jinping is the emperor of everything forever in perpetuity. But of course, there's going to be a day when he's no longer uh, in a position to be able to continue leading the country. So I guess my question is, um, given a lot of people think that he, he believes that his current contemporaries are corrupted or have been corrupted by the um, cultural revolution, sorry, the poster going out, opening out Deng Xiaoping's um, policies, what do you think, there, if, if there is a plan in place for succession and what might that look like um, and what's going on behind closed doors? Right. Okay, can, can we just take each of the questions and then we'll put them together. Please at the lodge. Yeah. Yeah. Hi, I'm Joshua. I'm a sophomore at Harvard College. And, Hi, Joshua, uh, sophomore. <laughs> <laughs> I was wondering, at what point do you think the US and its allies will be unable to compete with China using non-military tools? And by that, at what point will the terms of the deal be so insurmountable to the US that like, neither political party would be willing to accept the terms of any feasible deal? Okay, Excellent. and the final question is this. My name is Rob Lee, Prime Minister Rudd, thank you for being here. Uh, my question is, with U.S. global leadership uncertain for the next few years or more, um, how do you see mid-sized economies such as Australia counterbalance China's rise? Is it with partnerships through the other Commonwealth nations, ASEAN, or, or who else? Good. Three uh, excellent questions. I'll try and avoid uh, at those which are really hard um, in the tradition of mainstream Australian politics. Um, on the first question about uh, the Xi Jinping succession, I think uh, Xi Jinping doesn't think in terms of a succession. Um, uh, and, uh, and how do we know that if you look at the current composition of the Standing Committee of the Politburo? No one there is being groomed to either become, uh, to become the next General Secretary of the party or the next President of the country. Uh, if we flip back to the previous cycles, uh, at this stage of the second term of the incumbent, as you know, these, these folks were pretty well identified by about now. That's not the case. Why is that not the case? Well, uh, Xi Jinping, as I said in my earlier remarks in response to Graham's question, has his own vision for China's future. Uh, you've heard it described variously as the China dream, variously as the great renaissance of the Chinese people, etc. But Xi Jinping also sees himself as a man of destiny and therefore as uniquely qualified to lead China uh, to the realization of this particular national aspiration, this national dream. Therefore, uh, what I see is Xi Jinping seeking to remain in office for not just an additional term, but several additional terms. Um, Xi Jinping is now in his uh, mid-60s. Uh, Chinese leaders in the past, uh, who are revolutionary leaders, 
uh, have been there until their late 70s and into their 80s. So I've noted carefully when Xi Jinping has begun to talk about uh, a mid-term goal of 2035, uh, neatly juxtaposed between the centenary of the party in 2021 and the centenary of the PRC in 2049, that this period between now and the mid-2030s uh, is something where Xi Jinping would like to remain political act politically active as China's uh, leader or effective leader. Will that be possible in terms of those who do not agree with his policy views uh, is an open question and no, they haven't been on the telephone to me to tell me what they plan to do. Um, so that's just my analysis. Okay. On the question um, above, uh, which was about, think, 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 think. Uh, like, when will China outcompete ah, the yeah, US? Right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So uh, your question's important because certainly in Republican circles at present in the United States, uh, there are many led by Steve Bannon, for example, right out there, um, who argue that uh, there is less than a decade uh, for China to, for the United States to, as it were, act uh, in order to uh, prevent the United States from having terms dictated to it by a, an economically and ultimately militarily dominant China. Um, uh, Steve Bannon is prosecuting a particular political argument there, uh, and I think we're all familiar with the reasons why. Uh, but having said that, in the decade ahead, I think a key question in terms of China's national political self-confidence on the global stage uh, is this question of when does China become if it becomes uh, the world's largest economy. And why do I say that? Uh, the trajectory point has uh, floated somewhat from the early 2020s to the late 2020s and even to the early 2030s. Uh, and this is GDP measured in market exchange rate terms uh, because the US economy has been doing remarkably well uh, and the Chinese economy has been slowing. And this comes back to the ultimate question of the success or failure of Xi Jinping's preferred political economy model for the future. One final point on that. For 40 years, China has been a phenomenal success because the Chinese private sector has driven the growth of China. It's now 60% of GDP. When I went to work in China, it was 0% of GDP. Okay? Those of us who are Laogambo, like me, old cadres, uh, we remember uh, So this has changed. But if Xi Jinping's political economy model puts that into reverse, and there are early signs that the Chinese private sector is losing confidence, then the question of the economic trajectory and the crossover point between the US and China uh, becomes a much more open question. And sir, uh, in the third part of the gallery, maybe I'm just getting a little older, but I, you need to refresh my memory as well. Uh, with US leadership kind of in question. Oh yeah, that's right, the, the allies and how do they collaborate with each other. Um, I think the common script among all American allies at the moment is along these lines. Don't panic, let's just hide. Um, <laughs> the, uh, uh, and, uh, and so, uh, w uh, that was a joke, by the way. No, <laughs> it's a good joke. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> And, uh, you could see some of this in uh, London this that's week. Right. Yeah. And uh, because it is unusual for American allies to be dealing with a president of this type. And so allies have been quietly talking with each other about what do we do with the problem child. <laughs> um, and I'll let you speculate as to what the problem child refers to. And it's not the little sound of the voice in the room up the back there. Hi, sweetheart. Um, it's someone considerably less advanced. Anyway, the, um, the, uh, <coughs> my, uh, that, that was gratuitous, but I meant it. The, um, the, uh, I mean, it, it's, it's a remarkable thing when this country has a child as its president. Uh, and I say that's as a longstanding ally and defender uh, of the United States of America throughout my political career. I, I find it just deeply disturbing. So what allies are doing is uh, seeking to maintain the status quo um, uh, in their um, relations with Washington and with each other um, and looking very carefully at what the United States does electorally at the end of uh, 2020. 
If the uh, American people re-elect President Trump, uh, the degree of uh, prospective unraveling uh, of existing security assumptions, both in Europe and in Asia, should not be underestimated. I think that's a very good place to stop for tonight. It's a sad thing for me to bring us to a conclusion, but I think we've had a great opportunity to hear from Kevin. I think we can all look forward to reading his book when it's done, and we hope he'll come back often, so let's say thank you. Thank you.